Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Pass Ball Show. This is the 19th day of February 2018. Happy to be with you. Lots of different topics we're going to hit up today in the world of baseball, sports, and unifying America. But before I get into those things, I will throw the phone number out a little bit later on if you want to be in involved in the program. But I'm happy to be joined right now by a man that pitched 11 seasons in the major leagues for the Minnesota Twins and a handful of other teams, and that's Mike Tromley. Mike, this is John Pielli over in New Jersey. I appreciate you having a couple minutes. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me, John. And, Mike, first thing I want to ask you, you know, you know going back to you know your days as a kid, uh, talk a little bit about your involvement in the world of sports and what got you into baseball as a kid. That's pretty cool. Now you're saying you, you're you're looking at you know whatever life it is that you wanted to get into and weren't expecting to play baseball or any sport professionally. Uh, was there a certain time that you saw the change and you said, "Hey, you know what? This could really be a, a reality." And once again, joined by former Major League pitcher Mike Trombley. Now, you know, when you come up through the minor league system and, you know, starting in 1989 when you're drafted and obviously, you know, this is a, a, a different time in your life. Um, you know, did you notice uh, any big adjustments that you had to made it, at, make as you're going from, let's say, pitching, you know, in Duke to pitching at the, you know, on a professional level, obviously the competition is going to be a little bit better, but was that, was there anything in regards to what you did as a pitcher that you had to change as you're coming up through the prep professional ranks? You know, I made changes all the time. And it's one of the things that I think all of the kids really have to learn, uh, not even professionally, but you know, through high school and college and to go to, you always have to evolve. Nothing is ever a done uh, product. So I was always changing, whether it's my delivery, whether it's my mentality, whether it's my pitches in general. I remember, and a quick story was, um, coming out of Duke, I threw a split-finger fastball. I had a breaking ball that was more like a slider, and uh, and I threw a split-finger fastball. When I roomed with Denny Nagel in A-ball, and I saw the the potential of a great changeup, so I started throwing a changeup a lot in, in A-ball. Um, and so that became my off-speed pitch, along with my, my slider. And then 
as it evolved, I went back to the split later on, and it was just like a revolving door. It, I don't want to say a trial and error, but it really was kind of a situation where, you know, um, I was always trying to grow as a pitcher and grow as a student of baseball and, you know, hey, what works, what doesn't work. And anybody who's a Met or Yankee fan out there, they, you know, in New York and, uh, you know, knowing that, I, you know, I had to evolve. These hitters were good. So I had to really change in, to make things work. I was not blessed with a 95 mile hour fastball. So I really had to do my best to, um, and I don't want to downplay it, but I wasn't a, a star by any means. I was a guy that just kind of, um, you know, was an 88 mile an hour throwing right hander that needed something extra. So I needed to um, think my way through the game and really, you know, evolve and really learn as I go. Uh, again, I wasn't Ken Durfee Jr., I wasn't Roger Clemens. I really had to make the most of whatever I had. And once again, Mike Trombley joins the broadcast. Um, as you were, you know, you know, when you went to Duke, were you mostly a starting pitcher? I was a starting pitcher all through Duke. Yes, I was. And actually, I was a starting pitcher um, early in my career. I came up as a starter. I was a, a starter in the minor leagues. And only became a full-time reliever in probably 1996. And, I, and actually, looking back now, of course, I wanted to be a starter. Um, a, a lot of people want to be starters, and that's where you, know, you get the four days off, and it's an easier, I don't want to say it's an easier gig. It's, of course, it's hard to pitch in the major leagues, but uh, I was much more suited to, to be a reliever. Looking back now, I kind of learned and swallowed my pride and said, hey, this is probably a better fit for me because I could pitch every day. And, you know, my, my arm held up day-to-day -day pitching, so um, it was just a better fit for me being a, a turning into a, a set of man than a closer for one year. Now I tell you, you look at the game the way it's changed now. You have you have pitchers that are, you know, from the high school level are, you know, maxing themselves out as relievers and that's the way they're marketing themselves best. But obviously for you as a starter, who was a starter, you know, well into his professional career, there probably had to be some adjustments that you had to make to get used to, you know, the whole workload of a reliever. Did you find that there was anybody in particular, whether it was a pitching coach or somebody that worked close to you, that you felt was a good influence on you making a transition into a relief pitcher? Yeah, you know, obviously I was blessed with a Twins organization that was really, um, and, and again, I have I'm very little con to compare it to because all I knew was the, was the Minnesota Twins growing up in their organization. But Rick Aguilera was a big influence on me. He was the closer for us. Um, with the twins, and he uh, he really was good with the young guys. He was a great leader, and he really taught me how. He, and he even said to me at one time, he was, you know, Mike, as a starter, you know, you could go up and pitch every five days, and if things don't go well, you got four or five more days to think about it. But as a reliever, it's almost like a blessing because you're out there every day, whether the results are good or bad, you're out there the next day. So you got to keep proving yourself, and you know, and the more I grasp that idea the better I got because it wasn't, you couldn't rest on, hey, I had a great game or, uh, you know, and, uh, on the other side, if I had a bad game, you know, you had another chance the next day. Now, Mike Trombley joins the program. And, you know, I tell you, from, you know, Rick Aguilera's standpoint, he'd be the perfect guy to learn from. I mean, he came up as a Absolutely. starting pitcher in his, his days early on with the Mets and was still kind of hanging on to being a starting pitcher up through that that last year that he was traded to the Twins in the Frank Viola trade. So, you know, he, he made the transition, and I'm sure he helped, he helped make it a little easier for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, it was a perfect fit because he was a starter. He came to the Twins. He had great success as a closer. And so he knew exactly what I was up against. Uh, and, and it could have been... He could have been nicer. He could have been more professional to help the young guys. And I think that's something that I, you know, said before is it was I was so spoiled having good leaders in Minnesota, the, and that not only the, the Aguileras, the Herbecks, the the Puckets. It was just a great bunch of guys to be around and really learn from. Now, go back a little bit further before you made your major league debut. Of course, 1991, the Minnesota Twins win the World Series. Now, did you have a chance to go to spring training that year with the Twins? My first. Okay. Um, and we actually were a very good team in 1992. Um, so I got my first sniff of Major League Baseball um, in the spring of 92. And I don't know if you remember that team, but they were as, as good as the team that won it all was. Yeah, they definitely and were. We lost to the A's just by a couple games late in the season, but it was just two divisions, the, the, uh, the East and the West. Um, and those were the Oakland A's days of Conseco and McGuire, and they were loaded with Bob Welch and Stewart and uh, Eckersley. Um, so it was a it was a really fun time. It was, I look back at those those days and very fondly. Now, 
Now, you, you look back at that time, you're playing in the A's, who obviously were a good team, and the Minnesota Twins were as well. How intense was that kind of rivalry? Did, did the Twins, per se, hate the Athletics and vice versa? Was it, you know, what was because you see as the game has kind of changed a little bit, that type of rivalry doesn't really exist anymore. Did it exist back then? Yes, it did. And I remember the first time I realized it was we were, I think, a game back in 1992. We went to Oakland on a Friday night. We had a three-game series with them. And it was really like, and again, I seem like I, I, that's one thing, and I don't want to get off topic too much, but it's one thing that I really am proud of is I really didn't take things for granted and appreciated the moment. And, you know, here again, this kid from Wolverham, Massachusetts, we go into Oakland, we're, we're two. We're a game behind the Oakland A's. And their lineup was as solid as it could be. Ricky Henderson and Carney Lansford and McGuire, Conseco, um, all these guys, and Dave Henderson. And so one game up, I think they're starters, and I could be wrong, but I think they were uh, Darling and Stewart and Welch those games and Eckers in closing. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, this is what the big leagues is all about. We had a really good rivalry with those guys. There was no, I, I shouldn't say it was a, a, a fighting rivalry, but it was a very bitter rivalry that they, they knew we were good. We knew they were the, the same way they were good. So it was a really fun time. I remember thinking that, hey, this is what the big leagues is all about right here. Yeah, no question about it. Once again, joined by longtime major league pitcher Mike Tromley. Um, you know, I want to take you back a little bit because, you know, you, you, you mentioned, you, you know, you grew up in Massachusetts. You were uh, a big time Red Sox fan. As far back as you can remember following the Red Sox, if you can paint a little picture of the scenery that's going on around what year it is, who are your favorite players growing up? You know, what, what was it about the Red Sox that kind of got your, you know, got you behind them and supporting them as a kid? Well, just like I'm sure the Yankee fans and Mets fans are out there saying, I mean, us here in New England, we drink the Kool-Aid. You know, we're Patriots, we're Red Sox and stuff like that. But I remember growing up in, I think I was born in 1967, 1975 was really the first season that I really followed baseball really closely. And that was no question. I was a Carl Fisk, Dwight Evans, Jim Rice, Freddie Land, Yastrzemski fan. I had posters all in my room. I had every baseball card. Um, I just... You know, they were idols to me. Um, and, and so I remember those days really fondly of of really following the Red Sox and really thinking about, hey, how cool would that be? Um, and I, I was fortunate enough to obviously play for the Twins, and the Red Sox were in, were in Fort Myers, Florida, later in the years um, after Winter Haven. So they came to Fort Myers, ended up living right across the street from Dwight Evans, and all I do is wear him out. Hey, what was this guy like? What was that guy like? And it was it was kind of fun. Became good friends with uh, Carl Fisk. Um, my roommate in college was Greg Torborg. His father, Jeff Torborg, obviously coached with the Yankees, and um, it, it was a big part of Major League Baseball. So I just ask him all the time about certain guys, and, and I really, I, again, I was a major league myself, but I was more like a kid in the candy store talking about. Um, Now, obviously, you know, as, as you're going on, you know, you get a chance to go to Fenway Park, but, you know, you get, get to go to Fenway Park as an opponent. Was that any different from you as opposed to going to other visiting stadiums as a, as a major leaguer? Yeah, obviously I had a lot of family and friends come to Fenway to visit me and a lot of kids that I grew up with at the high school that I'd see at the games. Uh, yes, it was. I can, I can tell you that. And I kind of got yelled at by the coaches a little bit because the first time I ever went out for BP at Fenway, What's the first thing I did is I run out to left field. You know, we're during batting practice, and here I am in left field trying to field balls off the walls like he's trips he used to, trying to throw him to second base, hold the guy in the single. So I was, uh, it was really fun. Um, of course, going as a kid and a fan growing up, and then here I am, a player in uniform on the field. It was pretty special. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking of the movie Fever Pitch with Jimmy Fallon. And he's, you know, he's got that he's got that scene at the at the end where his you know his girlfriend ends up going onto the field, and the only thing that he could think about is well oh, how how how's the grass you know you know all all excited that she got to touch the grass at at Fenway Park that's kind of the scene that's going through my mind now. Absolutely right. So my favorite so my favorite line of the movie is was it, what was the, what was the grass like was it spongy? <laughs> you know, great stuff, man. That's exactly what 
what it was. I was out there, you know, go behind the wall and uh, see what Fenway's like and go into the tunnels and say, hey, this is where, uh, you know, Clement stood. This is where Yaz stood. This is where, you know, uh, Ted Williams, you know, stood in the batter's box. Great stuff. Yeah, I tell you, you know, you look back to the history of, of Fenway Park and obviously to, you know, to grow up near a, a stadium that's such, you know, so iconic. And uh, go back as far as it did. I mean, even in the days of Babe Ruth. But, of course, you know, like you mentioned, Ted Williams played there. Yaz played there. You know, all, all, these, all these other greats and, you know, immortals to the game, you know, played on the same field as you. I mean, that's, that's pretty damn special. Once again, joined by Mike Tromley. You know, you look at baseball, the way it's changed now, and a lot of it really isn't anybody's fault. And that's the one thing that I continue to reiterate on the show. You know, there's there's things and, you know, backdrops and things were going on in the country from years upon years. And this game of baseball has seemed to prevail through everything. And, you know, we're in a technological stage where there, a lot of people, you know, have technology right at their resources so the game has changed because of it but also the fan experience has changed a little bit what would you say in your own mind is the is the biggest change that you've seen to baseball now as opposed to when you played No, it's so true. And I tell you, you know, there's a lot of different things that are involved in that. I mean, you know, free agency allows for the players to earn more, which is good for them. But because of that, it just opens up a lot more, comp- you know, competition for player services. And obviously, you know, owners are always going to want it no matter where the game goes. And we're seeing it, you know, you know, with the free agent class that's going on. Our owners are trying to curtail spending and drive down player salaries the best way they can. I did want to ask you a question about arbitration. Now, did you did you ever have to go through an arbitration process at any time of your career? Yeah.
of this. So, uh, you know, lack of a better term, it's, it's an interesting process. But um, if you kind of keep in, in mind that, hey, no one's trying to beat anybody up. They're just trying to make, do what's right for the team and, you know, both ways. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's really a, a, I'm very thankful that people before me put this in place to help the players. I really am. I'm very thankful. Nah, I'll tell you, you look back at the days of, of Marvin Miller and everything that he did from the, you know, the initial cases, which – you know, involved in some cases with cat, let's say a catfish hunter. There's you know a clause in his contract or a bonus that he wasn't paid, which allowed him to become a free agent. And of course, what Andy Messersmith and Dave McNally did by essentially playing a season for nothing, so their you know option year would allow them to become a free agent. So you know there are a lot of you know a lot of people to thank for you know, obviously your generation of players, but you know just as importantly to the players that are playing today. Absolutely is. And once again, John Pielli joined by longtime Major League pitcher Mike Trombley. Last thing I want to ask you, you know, in regards to what you've gotten involved with, with financial planning. I know you mentioned, you know, that it was something you kind of went to school for. It was something you were planning on doing. Talk a little bit about your business now and, you know, if anybody's looking to get involved, the best way to, uh, to contact you. Mike, I really appreciate you having the time. It was great getting a chance to chat with you and uh, hope to have you on the program sometime soon. John, thank you very much. I'll be on any time you want me to. Hey, thanks a lot. And that was Mike Trombley, longtime Major League pitcher with the Twins in the early part of the 90s. Uh, pitched with the Baltimore Orioles and a handful of other teams. But you know, a couple interesting things there. I mean, I liked getting into the fact that he, w- he was a Red Sox fan growing up because, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, the history of the Red Sox goes back, obviously, to the days of Yastrzemski and Ted Williams and Fenway Park and every single thing that, you know, involved that. And, you know, to grow up as a fan of it, and not only that, but to have the opportunity to go on that same field. You know, in his case, he was an opponent, but, you know, there's no way that that fan inside of you is not going to come out, even when you have reached the elite of the elite, you know, being the top whatever, 1% or 2% of all baseball players out, not only in the country, but in the world. Uh, you know, that fan inside you still exists. And, you know, it's great that he was able to share stuff like that, that, you know, he still c- kind of thought of, you know, what it was like to be a fan and the fact that he was on that field that still, you know, Dwight Evans and Jim Rice and, you know, all the players that, you know, Carlton Fisk, the guys that he looked up admiring as a kid, you know, he's able to be on that same field. Once again, John Pielli, 
with you and apologize for going over the halfway point, having the cuckoo clock going during the interview. But, you know, something we try not to do, but Mike was providing a lot of really good content there and hope to get him on the show again in the future. Once again, the number if you want to be involved is 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. A couple different things that I want to touch on today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Mets and David Wright. You know, David spoke to the media on Saturday. You know, and the one thing you can always admire about him, no matter what is going on, no matter what the backdrop is of what he's dealing with in regards to his injuries, what his prognosis is of you know, whether he knows or has an idea at all, whether he's going to get back on the field or if he, if he does, when he's going to get back on the field. Anything that's going on, he's still willing to stand there and take as many questions as any reporter that's there has to ask him. And, you know, he is the epitome of what a professional is. And he handles it with respect and dignity. And he didn't really give you a whole lot. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I don't think he really knows what his future is. I don't think he knows exactly when he feels like he's going to be able to get on the field again. You know, they say he's resumed baseball activities. Well, you ask yourself, what is baseball activities? Is it running? Is it swinging a bat? Is it throwing a baseball around? It's a very vague statement. It could mean any one of a number of different things. But I do think we've hit a certain point. And David, of course, has three years left on his contract with the New York Mets. But, you know, you were getting to a point where I think even the Mets are starting to get the sense that David may not be coming back. And the reason that I say that is if you look at the Mets offseason, the way it was set up from a spending standpoint in regards to the amount of money they had allocated towards their payroll, it, it was expected that they were not under the assumption that they were going to be able to go above where their payroll was at last year. In fact, the initial reports were that the Mets were expecting to be maybe about $10 million less in payroll than when they were at the start of last season. So as the offseason goes on, obviously nobody expected free agency to go as slow as it has this year. And in some cases, salaries have been curtailed. You look at a guy like Jay Bruce, who on a normal year could probably have gotten four or five years at about something close to 18 to $20 million a season. He ends up signing a three-year contract, which on the average annual value will pay him about $13 million a season. Other players were expecting to get a lot more based off of salaries the way they've been set at the last couple of years. And there's a certain percentage, maybe 1%, 2%, that they've gone up over the last couple of years. But, you know, you look at, you know, the offseason, the way it's set up this year, it kind of worked into the Mets' hands a little bit. The Mets were expecting to not spend that much money or get themselves past a certain level in a $140, maybe $145 million range. All of a sudden, we're able to take a couple different chances. Now, how this ties in with David Wright is I think the Mets, whether they've gotten medical reports or they're just getting a sense that David Wright may not be on the field this year or may be on the field very little until his contract is over, I think they were able to take that into account when they were putting, you know, when they were making, let's say, their last couple free agent signings. Of course, Adrian Gonzalez kind of goes that, you know, falls into their lap for the league minimum with the majority of his salary being picked up by the Atlanta Braves. But... You know, if you look at a Jason Vargas signing, if you look at a Todd Frazier signing, perhaps if they're expecting David Wright to come back and be able to contribute at all in the 2018 season, the Mets may not have made those signings. Certainly the Frazier signing, because Wright plays the same position. So if David Wright or if the Mets were expecting a lot out of David Wright or him to be in a lineup anywhere close to opening day, they wouldn't have signed Todd Frazier. And I think because... The Mets are being compensated for their insurance policy that they have on his $20 million contract, that they're getting 75% of that back if David Wright doesn't play. That allowed them to sign Jason Vargas as well. So to make a long story short, you know, the insurance policy that the Mets have on David Wright 
probably allowed them to spend a little more money than they wanted to. And because of that, I would expect that, you know, perhaps they're not expecting David Wright to be on the field at all this year. Now, are the Mets going to go as far as keeping David Wright from going on the field? I think that that's a little murkier waters that we'd be getting into. There would be a little bit more of a challenge, let's say, from David Wright or the Players Association if it ever came to that. So I don't think the Mets would challenge David Wright being on the field to that point. But I also don't think that they're doing anything to kind of nudge him and push him and say, hey, we need you on the field. you got to get back as soon as you can. Their approach seems to be, all right, David, you know, resume baseball activities, do things at your leisure, uh, you know, work with the team, be around the team, be in the clubhouse, be at Port St. Lucie in spring training, but don't push yourself. And if for some reason David Wright's not on the field for this entire season, I bet you Fred and Jeff Wilpon would look at that as more of a positive than a negative. I'm not going to say they're rooting for it, but they would probably from a financial standpoint enjoy having 75% of his salary covered through the insurance policy that they put on his contract as opposed to David Wright coming going on the field, let's say as a utility player, maybe hitting about 240, 250 with limited power and not being able to play every day while the Mets have to pay him his entire salary. I think it's hit a point with this particular player and this particular contract that the Mets are looking at possibly, from a financial standpoint, being better off without David Wright on the field. So what does this end up coming to? Well, David Wright at some point, you know, through his own hopes, is going to get himself into the best baseball shape possible, is going to get himself working out, is going to be playing some competitive games. And once he hits that point where he's ready to play on the field, the Mets are going to be set with a challenge. And that's whether they're going to allow David Wright to come back and play, which I would say about 97% of conventional wisdom points for them allowing him to. But will there be some sort of decision that has to be made over whether you know David Wright, as a player coming off the bench and not playing every day, and maybe playing a couple times a week, coming up as a pinch hitter, maybe another time or two, would the Mets think about challenging David Wright when he wants to come back on the field? Which would be an absolute disaster. We know that. It would be a PR nightmare. You'd have a player that's being paid by an organization, which, you know, you could think of all different labor laws and, and issues that the Players Association would have with it. But would the Mets have the balls to keep David Wright from playing on the field because of that insurance policy. That's something that has to come up. It may not be fair. I'm not suggesting that it should happen, but it's something that has to be thought about. Once again, John Pialli with you. Pass ball show to number. If you want to be involved, it's 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. Staying on the Mets for a second. Last weekend, the Mets plan a team bonding experience. They decide to go on a ship. They're going to go fishing. Good bunch of players, manager, people associated with the organization are there. And I think from that perspective, it's good when you're talking about team building. You got a couple new guys here. You got a new manager, a new coaching staff. From the beginning, what has manager Mickey Cowley been looking to instill in his team? Unity making sure that every player knows they're loved by their manager. So any sort of team bonding experience, I recommend. You look at what Joe Madden's done over the years, whether it was with Tampa Bay or with the Cubs. He has these little things that he gets his players together. They do silly things, but the bottom line is that, you know, chemistry gets built from that. And I think one of the most important things in baseball that you look at teams that end up having success is there is some chemistry that's built. Chemistry needs to be there when things aren't going right. You could have a bad game. You could have a bad couple weeks. You could lose more games than you expect. But when you build chemistry amongst yourselves 
and the players legitimately like playing with each other. It makes for a better time when things aren't going right. When you win, obviously everything looks like it's perfect. You know, the players on the field may hate each other, but if they're all winning, everybody's got a smile on their face and they're having a good time. But when you lose, and inevitably it happens with everybody, you know, there, there are no more dynasties, or there are very few dynasties in professional sports now. I mean, look at the New England Patriots, you know, from the NFL standpoint. Yes, they've had a great 17 years, but they haven't won the Super Bowl every year. They haven't been to the Super Bowl every year. So there, there's been times where the chemistry that has existed amongst the team has been challenged. And in every sport, it does get challenged. And you look at, you know, winning and losing. And maybe from the average fan or a person that's just following the game casually, it may not seem it's as big of a deal. But winning always builds chemistry. Losing always hurts chemistry. So going back to my original point, you got a manager or in other sports coaches that are doing everything they can to try to draw their players together. You know, have some team bonding. So the Mets decide to do this, you know, over over in Florida. They go on a boat trip and, you know, one of their guests somehow, way or another, whether the Mets, you know, invited him or he was there or he was a friend of somebody, was happens to be none other than Donald Trump Jr. Now, my opinion about this, and obviously everybody is entitled to their own opinion, but... You can't judge a team based off of who they hang out with. But for some reason, a lot of people want to make such a big deal about it. And who cares based off of political beliefs? Who is there with a professional sports team? I'm not looking at it as if it's a good thing or a bad thing. And I told you, when it comes to politics, I stay out of it. I think there's nothing that has divided this country more than the two political parties that we have in this country. And they've gone to a point where we could say that they are actually domestic terrorist groups that may not have originally been created to divide us, but that's exactly what they're doing. So you let something that involves, all right, the son of the president, whether you like the president or you don't like the president, is supposed to impact how you feel about, in this case, the New York Mets. And I think when we start to do that, and we make the feeling on the pres- about the president or not the president, or you know how you feel or don't feel about him, impact every single walk of life, we're losing it as a country. And I think if you look at anybody that is not part of this country, or anybody that's in a different area or region of the world, They're looking at what is going on amongst the American people. And they're laughing about it. They think it's a joke. They look at the United States of America as a joke. And it's not contingent on what political belief is better than the other. It's the fact that the country, which was originally created, you know, as a melting pot to bring all different types of people together, has all types of different people at each other's throats, which is basically the antithesis of what the country was created to do. So if you're going to let politics, whether it's at your own workplace or in your home or amongst your friends, divide you, you look at anybody else that doesn't have any vesting interest in his own country, You're making them happy. You're putting them in a better position where they feel like they have an advantage over you. And I said one of the most important things that I wanted to bring up on this show, and I don't care if it makes people not want to watch the show or not want to listen to me or want me to just shut up. You always have the the possibility. If you don't like anything I say, comment. Let me know what you think. But if it bothers you that much, you you could go listen or watch something else. I'm... I love the interaction. I'd like to have the back and forth with people that don't agree. But we have the freedom to be able to speak 
but also the ability to listen and choose what ways and what things that are brought up that interest us or don't interest us. But I think it's important to continue to get the word out, not to be any certain way. Be yourself. Express yourself. Make sure others around you know what is valuable and what is important to you. But also listen to others that may not be like you, that may have reasons and beliefs, even if it comes to politics. I'm sure there's a reason that each individual person believes what they believe. And it doesn't make them right. It doesn't make them wrong. But what has been created by the United States of America going all the way back to, you know, the 1700s. It was created as a melting pot for the entire world. And there is no such thing as an American. American isn't white. American isn't black. American isn't male. American isn't female. America is a blend of everything. And within that, there's going to be differences that we all have. There's going to be priorities that you know some of us have that some of us don't have. There's going to be things that are of value to one person, but not of value to another person. And I just think we need to have more discussion and more conversation and open our minds up more to anybody else that isn't us, that isn't John Pielli, that isn't you there listening or watching. And there's reasons that you are what you are, I am what I am, and that next person is what the next person is. But if we sit there and listen, let another person that may feel a little bit differently than we do talk, we're going to find more common ground. And I think it, until we start doing that, we're going to continue to be you know, driven away by the propaganda that's out there. And it's almost like a devil-like aura that's sitting over us that is forcing us to divide and turn on each other. When in the end, we are all the same. And God didn't create us to be at each other's throats, to be at war, whether it's domestically or you know against a foreign nation. He created us all as his children. And... If, if we are having a hard time getting along with each other, it's not the other person's fault. It's ours. And we have to take that responsibility as we go to try to coexist with many people that are in us. And many of, of our friends that are different than other people. But the bottom line is if we're going to be successful and if we're going to get through this near civil war, where, which we're at right now, we got to all individually try a little harder. Not just the next person. Not just blame it on the president. Or if you're supporting the president, blame it on somebody else. We got to take responsibility individually. And that's for each and every single one of us. Regardless of what your opinion is. Regardless of the way you were brought up. Regardless of any physio physiological or sociological or psychological difference that you have. Every single one of us has to look in the mirror. Take responsibility. Take accountability. And when we go out there and we say, all right, there's another shooting, don't just say, oh, no, that sucks for them. Think about what we could do in our own personal life that could potentially save the lives of somebody else who could be involved in that next shooting. And rather than blame it on gun control or mental health. Take a little time to be around those that are close to us. Spend some time with people that may have a little bit of a difference from us. Understand how other people think that think differently than the way we think. And you know what? If we do stuff like that, we may be able to prevent the next mass shooting. Once again, John Pielli with you. The number is 732-364-3598. 732-364-3598.
couple different topics we'll hit up. And of course, this news just broke before the program started. And maybe about, I don't know, maybe about an hour or so before the program started. The Red Sox end up signing J.D. Martinez to a five-year contract for $110 million. Um, what the, the angle that I want to take here is I think it's going to be a little different than what, let's say, MLB Network's talking about or your local radio station that's you know, talking baseball at this moment. There was some fodder that was put out there, and it was about a month or so ago, about two months ago, and a couple different times before that J.D. Martinez had an offer on the table for $125 million over five years. Obviously, if he had an offer of $125 million, there'd be no way that he'd be signing a contract at this moment for $110 million. So not to quote stuff that we hear out there, you know, there's obviously some deception in the news world. Now, I believe that this is propaganda thrown out by the agent. And that agent I've spoken about on this show, I'd love to have him on as a guest and ask him a couple hard questions. And that's Scott Boris. Scott Boris has a job to do. His job as the agent is to get the player that he's representing the most money over the longest term of a deal possible. Not only that, but by getting his players the most money and the longest term contract that he possibly can, he's going to set the market to make sure that the next player that he's representing that fits the same description and the same qualifications and the same track record as the player he's representing now can get a better contract than the player that's signing right now. Well, what has happened in baseball? Owners have been curtailing their spending. There's been a handful of teams that have decided that they don't want to compete in 2018. They want to rebuild. Because of that, they don't need to spend the money on players that are worth what they're worth right now. So Scott Boris has got a job to do. Scott Boris has to get the best contract for the players that he's representing. If he doesn't, well, the players are going to get tired of Scott Boris as an agent. They're going to move on to somebody else. His agency, his empire that he's built over the last several years is going to gradually break down. He doesn't want to do that. So what he's got to do is he's got to throw a couple things out there. He was known about 15, 20 years ago for throwing the quote-unquote mystery team in there. You know, there's a couple teams that are going back and forth on a certain player, and he says, hey, there's a mystery team involved. They want to pay this, which in some cases allowed the players that he was representing to get bigger contracts than they were going to get in the first place. Well, in technology, the way we have it now, the fact that there's so many people working very hard behind the scenes to get data, to get information, to speak with people that are close to both the players, the agents, and the organizations. Reporting is a lot better, especially when it comes to reporting potential free agent signings now. Because there's so many more people that are in there doing the dirty work. So Scott Boris has to do everything he possibly can to drive the prices up. I would bet you that five-year, $125 million contract offer for J.D. Martinez was a complete and utter lie. He threw that out there with the thought that any team that was competing with the Boston Red Sox would know that that's what they have to start with if they're looking to sign the player. Remember, Eric Hosmer, another Boris client, had two offers that were thrown out there at about $147 million and $140 million from the Royals and the Padres, respectively. Well, he signs a deal with the San Diego Padres for less than $140 million over eight years, as opposed to seven years, which was rumored to be already offered to him. So my answer to that is pretty much Scott Boris is making up prices that are down from what he was expecting. He was expecting both players to be in the neighborhood of about $200 million when their contracts were signed, sealed, and delivered. But he's got to drive the price up the best way he can. And right now, he's caught, at the very least, in a little bit of a deception. Was it an outright lie? Maybe. But at the very least, he deceived the team's that are looking to sign the player, and in some cases he deceived even the players that he was representing. J.D. Martinez did not sign a contract, or has will not sign a contract, that's going to guarantee him $125 million over five years. Now understand, 
in a, in a landscape of money, it's still a lot of money. But the agent deceived not only the teams, not only the competing, team, the competing teams, but he deceived the player. Because he's got two top players that he's representing in this free agent class that ended up getting and signing deals that were less than the information that he was reporting out there that teams were offering his players. What is this going to do for the landscape of free agency? Well, at some point, teams are going to have to call Scott Boris's bluff. And the Red Sox had to at this point. The Red Sox understood that J.D. Martinez was not being courted by any other teams. In fact, what we find out now, really the only team that was in the running for a potential J.D. Martinez was the Arizona Diamondbacks, and they were looking for a much shorter term deal. They may have been offering or may be willing to offer a little more on an average annual value, but they probably weren't looking to go any more than two or three years. So Scott Boris has to, for his player, go with the longest term contract, and even if it meant that it wasn't going to be as lucrative per year. So when does that next player that's being represented by Scott Boris look back at the track record and say, hey, Scott Boris, similar to a declining player, similar to a depreciating player that is getting worse from year to year to year, Scott Boris is not as sharp as an agent as he was 15 years ago. He's not as sharp of an agent as he was 10 years ago. Is some of it because of teams deciding that they're not going to pay players as much money as they were? Or how much of it is Scott Boris losing a little bit of his own fastball? Now, when, when are players going to look at it and say, you know what? Maybe I should be looking for an agent that's a little bit younger, a little bit sharper. And maybe entering the prime of his career as opposed to Scott Boris that right now may be getting towards the twilight of it. Big thanks to Mike Trombley for joining the program today. A lot of great stuff there. If you missed the interview, it'll be up on YouTube later on tonight. Um, glad you could join me today. We'll be back with you tomorrow, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern on Periscope. Facebook Live, and On Demand on YouTube. Be back with you tomorrow. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.